But at the end of the day, what my real passion is, the real thing that I've learned, even though we're talking heavily about multifamily, is just to focus on stabilized cash flowing assets. And there's so many that you can do even outside of the world of real estate. Welcome to Truly Passive Income. I'm Neil Henderson. And I'm Clint Harris. We are thrilled to welcome Travis Watts, a full-time passive investor and the director of investor education at Ashcroft Capital. Uh, He has a wealth of experience in real estate investing and a passion for educating others. Travis has transitioned from active investing to building a substantial portfolio of passive investments. Um, We're going to dive into his journey and insights on achieving financial independence through passive investing. Travis, welcome to Truly Passive Income. Thanks so much for having me. Appreciate the invite, you guys. Absolutely. So we've spoken before. um, So I know quite a bit about your journey from oil and gas industry into active real estate investing and then to where you are with Ashcroft and as an experienced passive investor. But for our listeners who might not know you, walk us through your journey from active real estate investor to passive investing. Sure. Yeah. Happy to. So I got started in 2009 and ironically, you know, scary times, just kind of like we see in the headlines today in 2024. Uh, lots of my family and network and friends were not investors or real estate individuals, and they're all persuading me not to go that route. But I could recognize there was a buy the dip opportunity. So I got started in Colorado with just a simple townhome, uh, two bed, one bath, you know, $95,000 townhome. And first had a roommate for a while because I needed some place to live. That kind of opened the door to what passive income might be able to provide. So I wanted to scale that up. So I turned that unit into a full-time rental and just kind of went on to these condos, townhomes, single family homes, eventually getting into Airbnbs and short-term rentals and fix and flips and stuff like that. But my story really isn't unlike many people that get started in real estate. I, I, I The only thing I could comprehend back then was single family homes and that type of real estate investing. I had no idea what a syndication was, what private placements were. If you'd asked me, you know, who owns that apartment building over there, I'd say Wall Street. I don't know. <laughs> you know? So I ran into a couple uh, gentlemen through a real estate meetup. This was in 2015. And they had been full-time limited partners for a very long time, like 20 plus years. And again, I didn't know what that stuff meant. I was a little skeptical over it, but they were explaining how much more scalable it was for them to not have to be landlords and you know chasing down properties and showing up to closings and dealing with tenants and all this kind of stuff. So I was flipping a home at that time and it was about to sell. And I said, okay, I'm going to try it. I'm going to take half the equity uh, that I get in this deal and I'm going to put it into one of these so-called syndications. And I just, long story short, you know, it, it wasn't easy to pull the trigger. I was nervous. I, I was skeptical, but it it worked out. You know, I was getting monthly cash flow. Um, the deal sold early. Long story short. So I started just diversifying across a lot of different operators, mostly in value add multifamily syndications but later branched into all kinds of other assets that exist out there. I think that's key for your listeners to to think about and understand is that you really can, in my opinion, uh, diversify yourself or perhaps even an entire portfolio like I've done throughout commercial real estate with land plays and note lending and car washes and self-storage and mobile home parks and multifamily. There's so many different things that you can invest in. And really, it's been a journey of let's build up as much passive income as I can. Let's be as hands off as possible. And then let's use that income to basically pay for a lifestyle, you know, your bills, your expenses. And so it's it's been a fun ride. It's been a, a crazy last two to three years. We could dive into that here in a minute. But um, I really fell in love with with this business model and with this type of investing and so I reached out to Joe Fairless and Ashcroft Capital. I've been investing with them already in a handful of deals. And I was like, Joe, let me come on board. I can podcast. I can do webinars. I can go to conferences. I can do investor relations. Like you tell me what you need. And it's kind of a win-win, right? I can help you scale the business. And then we can reach a lot more people with this type of messaging. So I did that in 2019 and been with Ashcroft and Joe ever since. 
and also podcasting under his best ever uh, podcast as well. And it's been really great. It's been super rewarding. I mean, it, it's it's just been the highlight so far of my career. And so today, as director of investor development, I just help develop uh, investors. Again, helping articulate what syndications are, why they're beneficial. You know how they can help you achieve your goals, whatever those are. So, uh, in a nutshell, that's that's been the journey and the story so far. Uh, that's. Two point seven billion in assets under management for Ashcroft Capital. By the way, I might mention for the listeners. Is that up to date? It may. It may not be. <laughs> give it. Give it a couple of weeks. It'll be a lot higher, I'm sure. Um, so a, a lot to unpack there, and I, I'd like to talk about. You know, how do you pick fifty? You know, you're in fifty different deals with different operators. So I want to talk about your, how you think as an LP in terms of your underwriting and finding the right partners. But you also touched on diversification. And I think that I kind of have five components to the way that I view diversification. Uh, and I'm not going to say what those are until I hear what you have to say, but I'm really interested in what's your version of that for you. And I love the fact that in your role, that it's not, you are in investor relations, but you approach it as investor education. And that's the same way that Neil and I talk about it is our job is not to sell anyone on our deals. Our yep. job is to educate. We educate on what we do and syndication as a whole. And then it's that person's decision as to if it fits in with their goals and what they have for, for their future. Correct. So I, I love the way that you approach that when you're teaching on diversification at, for Ashcroft and as an individual, what's your take on that? And, and how do you lay that out? Well, I, I would start by saying this, you know, as far as investing goes, the first experience that I had was with single family real estate before I was ever into the stock market and other things. But there was a short period where I went and I worked for a very large uh, brokerage firm here in the US. And so I did the whole Wall Street thing and I got, you know, license, Series 7, 63, stuff like that. And I just wanted to be a little more well-rounded. I didn't want to be a one-trick pony. I didn't want to be so overly biased towards the only thing that I know how to do. And I just wanted to explore the other asset types. So in the stock world, it's a lot different. You're told about diversification among stocks, bonds, mutual funds, ETFs, but really they're all somewhat tied together and cyclical, right? If markets are generally just going down, like we saw in 08, 09, 10, then you know, your portfolio is probably down. So uh, I, I ended up going back to real estate and, and let me give you a couple case studies uh, or, or I'll share some of my own experience to articulate what I've learned about diversification. And the first is that there is no one asset type that's just going to be the clear winner for the rest of your life. And, and it's not going to go through any market cycles and there's never going to be volatility or disruption. It just doesn't work that way. But one thing I love about multifamily and residential is that it's such an essential need and we never seem to really catch up. You know, we were behind in housing uh, back in the Great Recession. And, and before that, since about the year 2000, we've been pretty far behind. That only slowed down construction and new development, right? 2020 only slowed down new development once again. And then uh, in, in today's world, we're seeing that building permits are down 40, 50% in most markets. That's just going to slow us down again. So one thing to think about is the National Multifamily Housing Council has recently come out publicly. They've said, we need to build 4.3 million more apartment uh, units between now and 2035 to keep up with demand. Well, statistically, every forecast you look at, that's just not going to happen. <laughs> so I like investing in things that have a real essential need. I always think about that in terms of stocks, right? You could own some random company that sells, I don't know, soda or something, but it's just to me not necessary. If it just didn't exist, we would all just move forward and be fine, but we've got to have housing. So long story short, um, I'm an advocate for invest primarily in what you know and understand. You know, multifamily's got, you know, a thousand plus year track record uh, as compared to like the latest trend and, and the new things that are popping up left and right. And then you can diversify, uh, as I mentioned earlier, in different uh, geographic regions, which is one huge perk to syndications over single family, at least in my case, everything I owned was like a 30 mile radius. I love syndications where I can be in all the forecasted growing states and markets across the US. But here's a quick example of why 
or how you could, you know, kind of niche diversify. So let's say I want to do two multifamily deals. Well, I'll just give you two examples, two multifamily deals that I invested in as a limited partner back in, I think this was 2018, I want to say. Um, one had floating rate adjustable loan. The other had a fixed rate long-term loan. Okay. So the adjustable went through some turmoil, as you might imagine. We had to reset the debt. We had some pause distributions, right? There's disruption that happened from that. And rate cap purchases went up 10X in that instance. The fixed rate long-term debt property has zero issues. Every year, we've been bumping the cash flow approximately 1% since 2018. So now I have a double digit cash flow that's paying me out, you know, on a quarterly basis. So. Um, that one's holding up strong. We just simply don't need to sell in today's environment. There's no reason to sell and, and we don't have to. So you can, again, diversify different debt terms, different asset classes, different geographies. But at the end of the day, what my real passion is, the real thing that I've learned, even though we're talking heavily about multifamily, is just to focus on stabilized cash flowing assets. And there's so many that you can do even outside of the world of real estate. One of my nephews right now, I just got him started with a vending machine business and it has nothing to do with real estate, <laughs> but he's cash flowing every single month with very limited time and effort that he has to put into it. And I've got him started with a brokerage account with just some dividend paying stocks and stuff just to show him that compounding effect over time. So again, to me, it's, it's all about uh, living a life on your terms, using passive income to help you get there. And uh, we can certainly dive more into kind of the due diligence side of that. But from a high level, that's my take on it. I love that. You you hit on all of the five components that are part of my personal strategy. And that's I'm looking for different assets, different geography, different operators. And the thing that I think a lot of people miss that you mentioned is I think that you need to look at different debt structures, yeah. v- fixed versus variable rate, because otherwise you may have different assets, different geography and different operators. But they're, if they're all on the same floating rate debt, your entire portfolio was just really exposed over the last 18 months. So right. I think the debt structure is really important. And then also the time component, like you're focusing on monthly cash flow up front. I yep. think that it's a good idea for me in the long run to sprinkle in some equity deals that are going to have larger payouts down the road. But the most important thing right now is, is obviously that cash flow and getting that up front. So that, that's exactly the same five things that I, I agree with. Uh, and I'm glad you unpacked that very eloquently by the way, um, talk to us about the, uh, the due diligence and picking the operators. You're in 50 different LP positions. How many operators is that? And what's the most likely way that you find an operator that you want to invest with? Yeah, it's been an, an evolution over time. And so one of the best resources that, that I can provide to folks is I, I ran 200 episodes under Joe's Best Ever podcast, Passive Investor Tips and the Actively Passive Investing Show. At the end of those, when I retired from that earlier this year, I made a book called Passive Investor Tips. And it's just 48 really quick chapters that are two to three pages in length that kind of go over uh, what we're talking about here. Due diligence, underwriting, how to choose different sponsors. It has a lot to do with a lot of different elements. But anyway, um, that was kind of my gift back to the world. I donated all those uh, profits uh, back to the best ever community to help them grow the education side over there. Um, but to answer your question, uh, I first started by recognizing that I didn't know what I didn't know, right? I couldn't just automatically know the best groups to work with and what would resonate well with me. So I started to hyper diversify early on. So 25,000 here, 50,000 there, 75,000 there across, I don't know, 14, 15, maybe 16 operators at this point, over 50 deals as an LP, additional investments and, you know, the, the stock world and stuff like that. But I, I kind of look at it this way. There's really three primary risk categories to think about. Okay. You have the operator who you're actually going to work with. What's their track record experience? What do they specialize in? Then you have the market. Markets are extremely important. And I'll explain that more in just a minute. And then you have the deal itself. And I think what I had wrong in the beginning and what a lot of LPs have wrong, in my opinion, is the deal gets put first, you know, show me your deal. How good is the deal? What's, what's the cash flow on the deal? I would say first look at who are you working with? You know, how, how do you know that they found a great deal and what's their track record of success again? And, you know, 
that kind of stuff. I've worked with, I'll give you one other practical, you know, story case here. I invested with a new operator. It was like their second deal that they'd ever done. They've taken zero deals full cycle. I decided to take a chance on them. I knew them personally. Uh, and again, this was early on in my journey. I think it was 2016. And they completely failed to execute the business plan, right? They, they needed to turn something like 400 units or, or what have you. They turned like a handful of units. And then they realized, well, we had the wrong property management group, the wrong contractors. We didn't budget correctly all kinds of problems. They had to stop distributions. It was a nightmare, but they had bought a good deal in a good market at a good time. And so we were all profitable in the end as LPs, but we were about 50% less profitable than we could have been with someone that really knew what they were doing. So I put about a 50% emphasis, not just because of that case, but a lot of different examples in my experience on the operator. 25% 25% on the market, 25% on the deal. And the fact is, if you're working with an experienced operator that knows what they're doing, then they're probably you know, researching very heavily markets and, and deals in the first place, right? A, a great operator is great for their own reasons. They're not going to go do a crappy deal and, and you know, potentially lose investor money and stuff like that. It goes on their permanent track record. So that's kind of how I approach it. I, I went to some real estate meetups. I joined some online forums. I've done a ton of conferences nationwide. I am the first to, to just tell everybody listening, that's not for everyone. I don't necessarily advocate for that. It's been huge in gaining knowledge and exposure, but just starting simply, just starting in general, listening to this podcast and other podcasts, reading books, not necessarily just, just my book, but other books on syndication and just educating yourself. And then taking a little bit of action, just do one deal, perhaps, you know, and see how it goes like I did when I started. And if you like it and it makes sense and you see a a viable future in it, 2024 is one of the best years, truly, in my opinion, that I've seen since I got started in 2015. So if you've been on the sidelines or thinking about doing this, really double down on 2024 in terms of your education and potentially doing one deal. And I think that'll serve you well about five years from now. Just my opinion. I want to unpack that. I'm going to come back to that point here in just a second, but I want to ask a follow-up question. Sure. As an LP, how do you balance doing that deep due, due diligence on an operator or a deal with, how do I put this nicely? Not becoming such a burden with your due diligence that the, that the operator just goes, hey, uh, listen, we appreciate it. Um, yeah, we don't. We don't need your money. Yeah, yeah. Um, word of mouth referrals go a long way. Testimonials go a long way. You kind of have to know a little bit about yourself. I mean, that really helps anyway. Just to know, for, like for example, uh, some investors, and I'm speaking, you know, from my experience and <laughs> dealing with you know lots of investors over the years. Um, communication is is so critical to some, right? They send an email and if you're not responding in half an hour, they're upset. Now they're calling you. You know, if you're not answering, now they're 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 calling the CEO, you know. So, if you just know that, then you want to look for groups that are great about communication and perhaps look for deals that maybe do monthly distributions and reporting as compared to quarterly or multiple years in some cases with development. Um And then, you know, you said something earlier, I want to kind of circle back to real quick. And that is that your standard uh, value add syndication has kind of a a trifecta to it, right? You you can potentially have uh, monthly cash flow, you can have potentially equity upside on the deal, and you can have tax advantages, right? So that's, that's huge for a lot of people. If you just think about all the investment types out there, especially like thinking about traditional investments. How many really offer you all three inside of a tangible asset that's highly in demand that has a thousand plus year track record? So uh, I know that's just a little side note there, but um, here's here's my practical answer to you. I start with I attend all the uh, information that's put out by the operator. So let's say they do a webinar. I I watch the entire webinar. Let's say they have a a CIM or a slide deck. Okay. I read through all of it. I just kind of write down on paper, maybe what's missing or what's still unknown that I feel like I need to know. And the reality is 
it, again, in my opinion, you don't need to know 100% of everything to take advantage of a deal. If you can just know 70, 75%, you know, that's to me good enough, right? The others kind of get filled in as you go. So I think this is where too many people, including myself from time to time early on, got so caught up in analysis by paralysis. You know, you just think, gosh, there's, there's so many deals, so many operators, all these numbers, all these terms to know. You, again, just to, to create a little momentum, just to start with maybe one deal and just go from there and then keep bouncing back to your education and then balancing that with taking action is kind of the solution I've found to be most effective. I love that. So uh, you mentioned really kind of buying the dip and, and the, where we are, the, the zoomed out view of where we are right now in 2024. So yeah. I know that you're very bullish, especially on uh, apartment investments and multifamily. So give me some of the reasons why, Right now is a really good time for Ashcroft and for investors uh, to be leaning in instead of staying out. Yeah, here's a few things to think about in 24. So it's not such a vague statement or it doesn't seem like just bias because that's what I do. So the first thing is when the Fed came in in early 22 to aggressively raise interest rates, with that came cap rates being raised. Now, cap rates, if your audience isn't familiar, is a, is a primary way that you can find the value of commercial real estate. You take the net operating income, you divide by the cap rate, which is different in every market, and you get a potential valuation. So when cap rates go up, valuations come down. Now, this is a lot different than single family because single family debt, it has a lot to do with debt, is, is what, a 30-year fixed rate mortgage or a 15-year fixed rate mortgage. In the commercial space, you've got so many short-term debt structures and bridge loans and adjustable rate. And, you know, if someone says long-term debt, uh, they might be talking about five-year debt, <laughs> you know? So uh, that's why valuations come down because you think about a hundred million dollar property and putting a $70 million loan on it. And then that loan going from 3% to 7%, that's a big deal. That's a huge deal, right? So in order for the next buyer to take advantage of that opportunity and be profitable themselves, they're going to have to get a discounted price because the debt is so much more expensive. So uh, back to real quick, this deal that we're buying in Orlando, it's our sixth Orlando deal, uh, a few miles from where I live. We're buying a class A property uh, at a five and a half cap where a deal like that just in 2021 for perspective would probably have traded at like a three cap or something like it. So the valuation is you know roughly 20 million plus down from where it would have been just a few years ago. So that's the buy the dip opportunity. And, you know, we've been putting fixed rate agency loans on our latest acquisitions. There's a case to be made for adjustable at this point because the forecast is for rates to come down. But I'm not going to get too much into the crystal ball forecast, but I do write a quarterly report called Market Insights on behalf of Ashcroft. And I'm pulling the sources from CoStar and CBRE and Marcus and Millichap and Urban Land Institute and the U.S. Census Bureau and the U-Haul stats. And I'm, I'm, I'm encompassing all that into a 10 to 15 page quarterly report with very little commentary as to opinions so that you, the investor, can figure out where do you think we are in this market cycle and where do you think the opportunities are going to lie? Uh, I already talked about supply and demand. We need millions more units built and, and Meanwhile, builders are just pulling back. So that puts us more in a supply demand and balance, which is really good for valuations. This year in 24, we're already seeing huge mega groups like Blackstone, which by the way, is the world's largest commercial real estate owner, uh, putting 10 billion plus into multifamily apartments. You're seeing JP Morgan uh, do joint ventures to buy multifamily. You're seeing Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon, you know, back a real estate company to buy residential real estate nationwide through almost like a crowdfunding type platform. So you're seeing the smart money, if you will. I hate to call it that. I like to think uh, all of us retail investors are the smart money, but you're seeing the big institutions jump in with billions of dollars this year to scoop up these deals, to buy the dip, to take advantage of this stuff. And the last thing I'll say, to not be so long-winded on 24 is right now in the United States, we have the largest gap in U.S. history between a new mortgage payment and multifamily rents. Nearly $1,000 in some case, in many markets, more than $1,000 a month 
differential. So A, a lot of people are just simply priced out of the single family home market. Most markets have continued trailing up in price despite these interest rates. And now mortgages are two to three X what they were in 21. It's totally insane. So to me, when I look at, you know, crypto hitting maybe close to an all time high and the stock market hitting close to an all time high and single family continuing to go up and then commercial on sale at the tune to 25 to 30%, you know, office space, perhaps even more in some markets. That's the opportunity, right? When one thing's on a drastic sale and nothing else is, to me, that just makes sense because your risk goes down as prices go down and your risk goes up when prices go up. And we can't forget that. Not to get into the crystal ball uh, as well, but we, um, to this week, the Fed's releasing a lot of key econ economic indicators and the betting markets, as far as the rates are going, say they think it's a 96% chance that we do not see a rate cut in the next three months, but a 96% chance that we see a rate cut in September. Yeah, which is very interesting, you know, which is kind of, you know, and there's a lot of people that believe that the the feds maybe, you know, the fed waited too long to to raise rates last time and they kind of feel like the feds waiting a little too long to lower rates at this point, you know. I, I mean, uh, and again, a lot of people are sort of sitting around go, well, I'm going to wait until um I'm going to wait until the fed starts to move before I I make an, a a move on housing or yeah. or whatever. Well, once that happens, like Katie by the door, I think that you're going to see uh, housing prices start rising again. And I, I don't know. Yeah, it's interesting. I was just watching a short little interview with um, Barbara Cochran from Shark Tank. She's been in real estate so many decades. And she's like, don't, she's a huge advocate for don't wait on, you know, to your point on, you know, she's talking about single family primarily. She's saying, okay, that $500,000 house right now with a 7% mortgage and the forecast of rates coming down. If you're saying I'm going to wait till mortgages are five percent, now it's five hundred and seventy-five thousand for that house. So your payment's really not going to change. You can always do a refinance later. Um, and to your point, that is the general psychology of so many right now is just wait and see. And we saw it in 2020, and we saw it in the Great Recession. Anytime there's turmoil or markets, even when the stock market falls, it affects real estate indirectly with investor sentiment. People saying, whoa, this is scary. What's going on? Maybe I shouldn't be investing right now. But if you look back at every single major dip that we've seen over the past several decades, that's always been the best time to get in. So you have to kind of fight your psychology a little bit. One thing that's really helped me over the years is subscribing to a dollar cost average mindset, which a lot of people do and they think about in the stock world, right? Maybe it's your 401k where every two weeks you're putting money into the stock market, your dollar cost averaging and not paying attention to the ebbs and flows um, or index funds or whatever in a brokerage account. Not many people talk about that in terms of real estate, but even though I was skeptical in 21 with prices and rents skyrocketing the way they did, I still made a good handful of investments that year. I still made about the same in 22 and 23 and now in 24. Hopefully I can do a little bit more this year. But you know, you're you're going to get the long-term average. And I'll end that note with a quick story of a well-known syndicator I reached out to way early on in 2015. I'm like, "Please put me on your deal list. I'd love to do a deal with you. I learned about you through such and such." And he's like, "Travis, it's 2015. He's like, in 2016, I foresee the biggest market collapse we've ever seen in this country. Mm -hmm. And we yeah. are not doing new acquisitions. I'll put you on our list, but don't expect to see anything from us potentially for years. And he was serious and he was true and he didn't do new acquisitions. I took a different mindset and was like, well, maybe, maybe not. I didn't necessarily subscribe to that. So, you know, between 2015 and let's say 2020, you know, I saw nearly a doubling of my portfolio as they weren't doing deals at all. And the and the bottom line is you just can't predict markets. I think we all know that the stats are out there. You don't know what the Fed's going to do, what the government's going to do. You don't know the election, who's going to win, what's going to pass, what's not going to pass, recessions and so on. So just stay consistent with it. And then if nothing else, recognize that it's very rare that commercial real estate goes down as much as it's gone down over the last two years. And now we're either at the bottom, near the bottom, or about to bottom. But in general, think about 
your average hold period in a syndication is like five years. So again, if you're buying now at a discount and rates do end up coming down and cap rates do end up coming down and you know new development's not happening like it was, where does that put you in five years? Potentially better than anything I've seen since 2015. So something to think about. All right. To tie this all up and to, to tie your point and Clint's point together about diversification, I think you're really hammering home the idea of diversifying across time with, with dollar cost averaging. Like, you know, so many people are like, well, I want to, I'm going to sit, sit tight and wait to like go big into the market and try and time it just right. Whereas you're saying like, listen, you're never going to do that. Uh, if you just focus on diversifying, diversifying across asset class, geography, operator, uh, debt and time and just sit there and go, okay, like who do I think, you know, where do I think the opportunity is this year? I'm still, I'm going to invest somewhere uh, and I'm just going to keep doing it. Spread, spread the the seeds around that in the end, you're going to come out on top. Exactly. Yeah. And I, before all this disruption with interest rates and the things that we've been talking about, I saw other similar minded psychology among investors. And it was Back then, you know, cash flow was slowly compressing over the years, especially since 2015 to say 2019. So it used to be deals would cash flow eight, nine, 10% right out of the gate year one. And then it would just go up from there. And then it was eight or nine, then it was six or seven, then it was five or six. And so I would see the psychology that's like, well, in the last few months, I've only seen deals that cash flow 6%. I'm going to wait on the sidelines till I find one that's 8%. Well, if you think about that logically, and it takes you six months to find a deal with 2% more cash flow, you just lost out on half a year's worth of cash flow. It would have been better to do that deal six months ago than to wait six months for something with a little higher potential return. So um, yeah, just don't wait. I mean, that's that's the biggest thing that, that I've learned. Well, listen, Travis Watts, I have thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. I know Clint has. It's always great chatting you with you, with you, my friend. If any one of our listeners want to find out more about you, Ashcroft, where would be the best place for them to do that? I've got a landing page for your listeners called speakwithtravis.com, and it's got my calendar link. I'm always happy to connect with anybody and everybody, uh, accredited, non-accredited, interested in Ashcroft, not interested, doesn't matter. Uh, happy to be a resource in the industry. Uh, and then also there's some uh, investment trackers on there, current offerings and opportunities like our Orlando deal and lots of stuff. So speakwithtravis.com. Be happy to uh, connect and, and help you out. Well, it's been great. Thanks, Travis. Thanks a lot, man. Appreciate your time. Thanks, Neil. Thanks, Clint. Thank you so much for listening and watching the Truly Passive Income podcast. If you liked the show, if you think it would be useful for someone else, the greatest compliment that you could give us would be to share the episode leave a comment down below or leave us an honest review. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to let us know down below. And remember, with truly passive income comes freedom of time, place, and the freedom to pursue your higher purpose.